Hi there. I'm glad you tuned into this video on why you should care about fish hearts. My name is Brianna Christopher. I'm an MD-PhD student at the Tri-Institutional MD-PhD program at Wall Cornell, Rockefeller, uh, Sloan Kettering. My pronoun is she. So I'll tell you a little bit about me first. I started off in college knowing I wanted to study biology, um, but I really didn't know what being a scientist actually meant because <laughs> I didn't know anyone who was a scientist. So I decided to jump right in and I joined a lab in my sophomore year, um, as you can see. And I promised I did more than take <laughs> selfies in lab. I actually ended up writing up a big book about fish hearts while I was there. We're talking like 80 pages. And I know you're thinking to yourself, Brie, why fish? Aren't you trying to become a medical doctor? This is a fair point. But studying fish can be a really useful tool for understanding what happens when a human embryo is developing. So with that, let's go to the fish hearts. All right, so onto the exciting stuff, um, like how does the heart grow and why are fish used for science? Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. And if you wanna keep talking about science or fish, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'd be happy to talk more. So this is a zebra fish. Um, these are fish that are a lot of times um, kept in fish tanks and they're used for research um, because it's easy to keep them. You just have several tanks with fish. They lay a lot of eggs. So um, that's very useful when you're trying to do an experiment and see if many of the um, fish that were laid um, have what you were looking for for your experiment. And I wanted to show you a little bit about um, the development of the zebrafish in general. So a fish lays an egg that starts as one cell, then it divides into two. Those divide up many more times and you start to get the initial um, shape that starts to look like a fish. Here you go, the head starts kind of climbing around the yolk sac, which is actually the nutrient source for the embryo uh, because they can't eat, right? So this has all the nutrients they need until they're grown up into a larval fish, right? So this is what a larval fish looks like. And then here's a juvenile fish that will grow up um, way bigger um, into an adult fish. And here's a close-up of what you can see under the microscope um, when a female fish lays her eggs. So here's an embryo at the one cell stage which divides and becomes two cells and then by two hours later you have a big bunch of cells over here. So what's really important about this is that a researcher could decide to add uh, some kind of protein or DNA or RNA uh, or other molecule in one cell and not the other one. And then when you have all of these cells d divide from these ones, half of them will have whatever was added and the other half will have the normal uh, set of things. Here's another cool thing you can do with zebrafish. You can take MRIs of them. So M an MRI is a magnetic resonance image. Um, it's used a lot in medicine to see uh, what's happening in people's bodies. Um, but you can, I guess, put these fish into a very tiny MRI um, and take a look at not only their bones, so here's the spine, but also their soft tissue, right? And it gives you a good sense for how the soft tissue uh, so all the organs of the fish are laid out next to each other, or 
around each other. Here's one of the, the uh, most beautiful things you can do. You can add some dyes um, to a zebrafish that will make it, the bones and the cartilage turn these bright pink and blue colors. And then you can clear all the scales off of the fish. Um, and you can actually see how these bones look um, when that fish passed away. So this is really useful for people who study bones um, to be able to see if they're normal or not, if there are any missing, um, and other questions like that. And this is a really exciting thing that zebrafish are useful for. So zebrafish embryos are completely translucent, so you can see through the embryo. Um, and scientists are able to take advantage of that because it means you can put a zebrafish under a microscope and see everything that's happening inside that developing embryo. In this case, they used a technique where they can trick the cells into making a protein that comes from jellyfish that are like deep down in the ocean. So that jellyfish has a protein that glows green in the dark. And if you trick the cells to make that protein, then those cells will glow green in the dark. Um, so for example, in this one, all of the blood vessels and the heart of the fish are glowing green. So when I say heart, you might be thinking of this symbol, right? Or maybe the heart emoji it has very complicated meaning sometimes. An ace of hearts, or even a human heart with its four chambers, right? You have two atria at the top and the two ventricles at the bottom and a whole bunch of blood vessels that are going to the lungs or to the rest of the body. But this is what the zebrafish heart looks like. So this is a two day old fish um, and they use that technique I mentioned before. So the heart is glowing green, right? The heart and the blood vessels. And what you see in red kind of moving through the heart, those are individual red blood cells. So they've been tricked into making a red protein that glows in the dark. Um, and that's why you can kind of see them moving through the heart and into the vessels. And all these vessels up here are near the fish's gills so that the, they can get oxygen from the water, pass it along to um, the through the blood vessel and to the red blood cells so that the fish has oxygen that goes throughout its body. Uh, so here's a closer look at what the zebrafish heart looks like. So again, two chambers. This is the ventricle and this is the atrium. Um, now you can see the entire fish with the heart glowing green, right? So eyes, head, and then you have the ventricle and the atrium sitting right under the head. And when you do mathematical modeling of this, you can see that the chambers of the heart are pretty round. They're kind of like kidney bean shape. And then there's this center region that kind of pinches off in between the two chambers, um, working as kind of a communication between them. So I'm gonna use a very unconventional analogy to explain how zebrafish hearts uh, get into the very complicated shape that they do. Um, and that will be curly, that will be based on curly fries. Uh, bear with me, hopefully it'll help you understand. So let's think about a curly fry that is um, one of those curly fries that when you pick it up, it stretches out a lot, right? It's not too crispy, so it kind of uh, moves apart very easily. Right, and you end up with this big curl here where the two ends are not really touching each other. And the reason I bring this image up is the zebrafish heart starts as a straight tube and then it bends itself around to put the ventricle kind of more forward in the um, fish and then the atrium down here in green ends up further back in the fish. And you can't really appreciate that when you look at um, kind of the flat images of the fish hearts that we were looking at before, 
So you see, if you drew a tracing, it would look like the two chambers were next to each other, when really it's a 3D shape, a helix. These chambers, as the heart starts to fill up with blood, uh, they start to grow and balloon out to be these rounded chambers. And that's how you end up with the final shape that we looked at before, the round kidney bean ch chambers um, that are roughly um, next to each other, but the atrium is kind of further back than the ventricle. Now, how does this relate to how human and other vertebrate hearts develop? So here's a diagram of that. So in human and other vertebrates, you end up with the same twisting, right, as before. You make that helix. But what ends up happening is that the helix gets really, really tight. And the atrium starts to get close to the top. And that's why you have the two atria end up at the top of the heart. So again, it's like a really tight curl, kind of like this curly fry, where the ends start to touch each other. Um, so it's kind of an additional step that happens for the vertebrates. Um, so perhaps zebrafish hearts can help us understand this process a little bit better um, to understand how you get a human heart. So this is another video that I took uh, under the microscope. So the white circles are in the place of where the eyes of the fish are. And you can see the cells, they're moving together, right? And it's gonna play again and I wanna point out to you, right? It starts out very wide and like the same uh, width the, at the beginning. And then you can sign it, kind of start to see these cells bend around. And see, they start to get narrow. And if you could see the ventricle under the head of the fish, you would see that it's a helix. So I'm gonna push the curly fry analogy a little bit further. So someone in your house is making curly fries in the kitchen. Um, the smell of the curly fries goes through an open door and you in a different part of the house start to smell the curly fries and think about them. And then you decide you're going to the kitchen to investigate if there are curly fries. If we think about what happens in cells then, so replace this person with a heart cell. And instead of curly fries, it'll be other molecules um, that um, tell the um, cell what to do, right? So the source, AKA the person making the curly fries, it could be another cell um, or a different part of the developing body, right? Sends out a stimulus, right? And that's the smell that the person smells, but for a cell, that would be the molecule kind of sticking to the cell surface. And that then tells the cell I should go do something. Um, and that could be dividing, it could be moving in a different direction, but the cell is gonna do something. In a different scenario, someone is making the curly fries in your kitchen, unbeknownst to you, but now the door is closed to the kitchen. So even though there are curly fries and they smell really good, you have no idea that there are curly fries because you don't get the smell and therefore you don't respond. So what I wanna use this to explain is that these doors being closed is similar to the concept of an inhibitor. So this is something that stands in the way between the stimulus, right, and the cell. So the molecules won't be able to bind it to the cell surface because this inhibitor is blocking the way. So this is why that concept matters to my experiments. During development, we know that all the cells of the body are producing a lot of different molecules. Um, and we don't quite know what the source is 
for this stimulus um, that works on heart cells, but maybe it's cells that are near the heart, maybe it's other cells um, from the blood vessels, we don't quite know yet. And I was in charge of studying fibroblast growth factor, uh, which is abbreviated FGF, which is a stimulus that when it binds to the cell, so it attaches, it tells the cell to do different things, like we talked about before. Maybe it's divide, maybe it's move, uh, maybe it's hold on to the cell next to you a little tighter. Um, a lot of different things can happen in the cell that gets the stimulus. For the sake of our experiments, we used an inhibitor called SU5402. Um, and this inhibitor is known to block FGF from sticking to the outside of the cell. Um, and the really convenient part of this inhibitor is that it's liquid, so you can just add a couple drops to the water that the embryos are in and then wash it out with fresh water later when you want to stop what the inhibitor is doing. Um, so it's very easy to do. All right, so this is a fish. I took these photos. It's very exciting. Uh, so this is a f fish larva, right? Head, eyes. This is the yolk sac, which is, we talked about before, carries all the nutrients for the embryo because they can't eat. And then right here, outlined in red, is the heart, right? You got the ventricle and the atrium. Um, it's kind of hard to see where they're placed because of, because the fish are on their side. But what you can tell is in these fish, where we gave the inhibitor, so FGF cannot reach the cell, the fish look a little weird, right? Their eyes are, and head are really small. Um, their heart is this long mess, <laughs> right? And then you start to see that it's a little swollen out here. So that's called edema. Um, and that means that um, white blood cells and water and other molecules are migrating into that part of the body. Um, and that's why it looks swollen. So in this experiment, we are going to use the inhibitor, SU5402, to block FGF at different periods in time, okay? So here is an example of the fish. Normal fish didn't get the inhibitor, so FGF is able to stick to the cells, right? And as you can see, very normal-looking heart, rounded out, and the chambers are next to each other. But if you took those embryos in the little dish with water and you add the inhibitor in the afternoon of day one and wash it out that night, what you see is that the heart ends up with the ventricle on top and the atrium on the bottom. And it's very linear, right? It looks like a line. And it's kind of stretched out. If you do the same thing, a little bit later, so you give the embryo um, the inhibitor, put it in the water in the morning of day two and wash it out later in the day. Um, and then you look at what the hearts look uh, formed as. Uh, you can see that the heart did start to bend. You can start to, you can sort of see the ventricle and the atrium, but they're definitely not these kidney bean shaped round chambers, right? Okay. So maybe FGF during this time plays a role in making them round. And then if you treat the entirety from the afternoon and day one all the way to day two, and then look what happens. It looks very similar to if you only treat um, early in day one, right? So that's kind of interesting that you don't need to inhibit for the entire period of time to see this. Uh, kind of linear shape develop. So what does this tell us? tell us? It tells us that FGF, when it's blocked, you don't get proper looping, right, making the helix, and you don't get proper ballooning, so the expansion of those chambers. And to really kind of drive home the point of um, the fact that the atrium should be kind of behind the ventricle, Here's a fish again um, under a light microscope on its side and you can see in blue outlined here is the ventricle and in red outlined over here is the atrium. 
And you see how it's the atrium is below and sort of behind the ventricle. And here's the same thing if you were looking from the belly of the fish, ventricle, atrium. The atrium looks kind of small because it's um, tucked behind the ventricle. Now in this fish, uh, which received the inhibitor, you can tell that its head small, eyes don't look normal, and you got this huge bubble of edema. The heart is not um, kind of sitting there in the same way, right? The atrium is kind of in front of the ventricle. They're a little next to each other. And you can see that when you're looking from the belly side of the embryo. Uh, we decided to measure how round the chambers were. So you can see that these are really round, um, especially because the lines going through it um, are almost the same length, right? But in the embryos that were given the inhibitor, one of the axes is way longer than the other. So that tells you it's not, a, not close to a circle. It's more like an oval. And then the last experiment I'll show you is this one. So this is an in situ hybridization. That's a kind of experiment that you do when you want to see where a particular molecule is uh, being expressed or produced. So that means you give um, a special piece of RNA, it'll go into the cells, it'll attach to the molecule that you're interested in studying in this case, NPPA, um, and those cells will turn blue. Okay, so blue means that they have the molecule, not blue means they don't have it. So NPPA is known to be on kind of the outer curve of the e chambers, and you can tell that in the middle here, right, at the atrioventricular canal, so right, that's the part between the atrium and the ventricle, there's no NPPA. But when we give the inhibitor, you lose that, right? It looks like a gradient, a smear of NPPA from the ventricle to the atrium. There's like no split in the center at all. And here's another example of that, right? Ventricle, atrium, and there's no spot in the middle that doesn't have NPPA. So this makes us think that maybe FGF is involved in telling this part of the heart uh, to remain different from the ventricle and the atrium. And if you don't get proper looping, then maybe the cells don't know that. So enough about fish. Um, I wanted to emphasize a little more on why it's important that we study these sorts of things. Um, beyond the fact that it's interesting to learn about fish, um, these sorts of studies have the real potential to help us understand uh, what things can go wrong during human development. So these are all people who were born with a congenital heart defect, and there's a lot of ways that the heart um, can develop improperly. Um, you could have vessels in the wrong place, the chambers could be... Um, smaller or bigger than they're supposed to be. Um, and usually this is something that's corrected at birth. So you can see that all of these people have a scar in the middle because I had to have open heart surgery. Um, typically when children are young, um, but maybe a little bit older depending on what type of defect they have. And even a couple decades ago, um, we didn't have solutions for these people. Um, we didn't have the, we didn't know how to do the surgeries to make sure that these people stayed alive or any other treatments. Um, so these people would die usually as babies. And now we have people who are living full, healthy lives to adulthood. Um, so doing this kind of work um, hopefully can help us learn more to make sure that maybe people don't have to have surgery done on them when they're born. Like 1% of uh, babies that are born in this country. That's 300,000 babies a year. And if you take nothing away from this lesson, um, 
I would appreciate if you remembered this at least, that sometimes in experimental science, you have to break things or mess them up to figure out what was supposed to happen. And I know people always talk about scientists as brilliant or being a genius or being perfect. The reality of it is none of us are perfect, trust me. And what you really have to do in science is figure out the right way to mess things up to then know how it's supposed to work. Um, and it took me a really long time to learn that in my training. So I hope that will be um, a good message and inspiring to you uh, to keep going in science if you're interested in it. Thank you again for listening to this talk on zebrafish heart development. My name is Brie Christophers. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this mini lesson by a future medical scientist. <laughs>